I was really interested in the story that Dr. Hopkins was sharing with us a while ago about Frank Houghton and how God used him at a particular time in a particular way to reach out to pre people in China without any knowledge that this was the pivotal moment. I also enjoyed that hymn. I don't think I've ever heard that before. But that's one we need to be using more often. But it got me to thinking about how God uses us in particular ways with particular people, sometimes in ways that we do not understand. There may be times in your life when you think, God just hasn't used me as much as I thought he would. But if you only knew, if Edward Kimball had only known. You see, years ago, Edward Kimball taught a Sunday school class in Boston, Massachusetts. And one day walking into that class came this guy. He didn't look good. He didn't act right. His manners were atrocious. He was one of those people that you just kind of instinctively didn't like. And he wandered in and Edward Kimball began to wonder, how in the world did this guy show up in my Sunday school class? And he began to talk to him about that. The guy's name was Dwight. And Dwight said, I don't want to be here. You probably don't want me here, but... I'm here, and here's the reason why. Because Dwight was one of these guys that just seemed to be on a fast track to nowhere. He never finished anything beyond the fifth grade, and that's as far as he could make it in school. As he got to be a young man, he needed a job. He needed a job desperately, and he had an uncle in Boston who said, okay, if you'll come to Boston, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a job in my shoe store on two conditions. One is, you will do what you're told without arguing or asking questions. And the other condition is, and you will attend services at my church every Sunday. Dwight didn't like either one of those conditions, but he did like surviving, and this was the only opportunity he had. So he took the job, and he moved to Boston, and that's why he showed up in that Sunday school class that morning, not because he wanted to, but because he had to. And somehow across the course of the next few weeks, Edward Kimball began to develop a heart for that young man. And he began to believe that God was calling him to share his faith with that young man to lead that guy to Christ, even though it was the hardest thing he'd ever tried to do. Later on, he said this. He had never met anyone whose mind was as spiritually dark as Dwight's. And there were times when he wanted to give up but he kept trying, and then one day he felt this strong urging from the Holy Spirit that today was the day he needed to go and share his faith again with this young man, Dwight. And he did, and he went and talked to him. He said the same thing he'd said before. He said it the same way he'd said it before, but something about that day made it special. And right there, in the showroom of that shoe store, Dwight gave his life to Jesus. And God began to change his life. A couple of years later, Dwight got a new job opportunity and he moved to Chicago. And when he got to Chicago, he decided that he would try to reach more young men just like himself. So he went out into the streets of Chicago trying to find those people and lead them to Jesus, those kinds of people that other folks weren't trying to reach. And he did it even though he still didn't have any good grammar, even though he didn't know how to conduct himself in public, even though he was not a great public speaker, he began to try to lead people to Jesus. And to his surprise, people began to respond. And before long, it wasn't enough to get small groups together. He had to find places where large groups could gather. And before you knew it, he was doing evangelistic campaigns. Now, he never called himself a preacher. 
But he was doing these campaigns, and thousands of people were coming to listen to this guy preach. And then he got invited to go over to Europe. And even there, he saw people coming to Jesus. In fact, it is estimated that by the time of his death, Dwight L. Moody led more than a million people to know Jesus Christ as Lord. He started a, a movement that was so powerful that even today, Moody Bible Institute continues to prepare people to minister to, to others all around the world. And it all started with one guy named Edward Kimball. Here's the interesting thing. And we don't know anything else about that man we have no clue whether he ever led anybody else to Christ or if Dwight was the only one you have to wonder if there were times when Edward Kimball must have stopped and, and asked himself the question have I really done what God wanted me to do shouldn't there have been more but maybe God's plan was that he be used in a powerful way in one man's life. And because he was obedient in that one time to that one call to go to that store on that one day, the world has never been the same. Hundreds of thousands of people will be in heaven because Edward Kimball was obedient to the Lord. You can't help but compare this story to the conversion of Saul at Tarsus and to the one God sent to help transform his life. You know the story. We read it together a while ago. One day he was a zealot determined to eliminate the Christian faith. Nothing more, nothing less. The passion of his life was to discover Christians, to either put them in jail or see them put to death. It was all he felt led to do. The next day, he was face down in the sand on the Damascus Road having a personal encounter with a risen Jesus. And because of that encounter, Saul would become Paul, the last of the apostles and the first missionary to the Gentile world. You can argue that apart from Christ himself, nobody has impacted the Christian world any more than the apostle Paul. God was going to use him in powerful ways. But before God could do it, he had to prepare him for the calling he was going to place on his life. God needed to use somebody to help Saul understand this is what God is up to and this is what God wants to do with your life. God had to find somebody who could take this zealot who once wanted to destroy Christians and prepare him for Christian ministry, for the rejection he was going to encounter, for the challenges that would be before him, before the, for the opportunities that would be his. Somebody had to get him ready. So here's my question to you this morning. So if you were God, who would you use? If you were God and you had huge plans for Saul, who would become Paul, who would you use? I don't have any doubt myself. If I were God, I know exactly what I would do with Saul. I would raise him up from the Damascus Road, and I would send him straight to Jerusalem. I would tell him to find Peter and John and James, those who were the leaders of the apostles, those who were the closest people to Jesus. And I would say to them, here he is. This is the one. You prepare him, and you send him out. It is your job to turn Saul into Paul. That's what I would do. It's the only thing that makes sense. But I am not the Lord. And the one who revealed himself to Saul on the Damascus Road had different plans. He had an unexpected role for someone to play and an unlikely man who was going to equip Paul. Let me tell you about it. Let me read to you about that man. You see, it's found in the 10th verse of that same chapter we read from just a moment ago. 
Well, the Bible says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is my chosen vessel to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. What a story. What was so special about Ananias? Why would God choose him when there are others who seem so much better equipped? Why in the world would God reach into Damascus when all of the action was taking place in Jerusalem? Why Ananias? He was not an apostle, nor was he called to preach. In fact, Ananias was just a believer, a believer whose name is mentioned this one time in the New Testament, and then he disappears, never to be mentioned again. What was it about Ananias? He was simply a believer who was committed to Christ and willing to follow where Jesus led not because he was an apostle, not because he was a missionary, because he was an ordinary man who just trusted God and did what God told him to do. Acts 9 describes how God worked in Saul's life through an ordinary believer, just like he used Edward Kimball in Dwight Moody's life. More than that, it challenges you and me because it reminds us of this. And God wants to do the same thing through all of us. Sometimes we think that God only wants to work through the people who are the professional ministers of the church. Sometimes we think God only wants to work through those people that everybody is flocking to. But sometimes we need to remember, God wants to use each of us. Even if his plan is that you touch one life. Because you never know what God is going to do when you're obedient to him. So this morning I want to take some time. I want to talk to you about this encounter that took place between Ananias and Saul. Because this is a picture of how a man who is willing to be used can be used by God to do amazing things, and he may never know it. Let's jump into the passage together. What we need to see is this. Before God sent Ananias, the Lord prepared Saul for that encounter. Before he ever met him, Christ was already at work in Saul preparing the way for Ananias to come. The Bible says immediately after his salvation, immediately after that encounter on the Damascus Road, that God began to deal with Saul in some specific ways. He knew that some, some fundamental things had to be different before Saul could be the man that God was calling him to be. Before God could use Ananias in Saul's life, God had to do some work himself. There were some things, some lessons that Saul had to learn. And before he learned these lessons, he wasn't ready to hear what Ananias was being sent to say or to experience what Ananias was being sent to do. So God began to teach Saul some tough lessons. First, the Lord taught him a basic lesson in trust. 
It happened immediately after Saul's saving event, after Saul's encounter with Christ on the road, and it was expressed through a question. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? It seems like such a simple request, doesn't it? But it required some real transformation in Saul before he could ask a question like that. He began by addressing Jesus as Lord, Lord. Only moments before, Saul had been dedicated to persecuting followers of Jesus. He was determined to wipe that name from the face of the earth. And now he was calling him Lord. Everything had changed. Jesus was Lord. Not in the world, but in, not just in the world, but in his life. This was the sure evidence of Saul's salvation. He was surrendered to a lordship commitment to Jesus. Somewhere along the line, when Christ calls you to lead someone to him, you have to lead them to the Lord Jesus. If you and I are going to be led by, used by God to lead somebody else to Christ, we're going to have to be uh, used to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the mistakes that a lot of people make, and one of the reasons that sometimes people mistakenly believe they're in a right relationship with God is this. Some people think that all you really need to do is have an acknowledgement of Jesus. You know, yeah, I, I believe Jesus was real. I believe Jesus was God's son. I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe there is salvation through Jesus. And that's really all I need to do. I just need to acknowledge the truth. But that's not at all what the Bible teaches us. The Bible says not only do you need to know the facts, not only do you need to understand the truth, but there has to be that transformation that takes place within your heart. That transformation when all of a sudden the Lord becomes your Lord. And you begin to call out the same way that Saul did, Lord, Lord. You are the Lord of my life. And then Saul settled the issue of surrender. Lord, what do you want me to do? Saul didn't know what to do next. He needed the Lord to show him. Imagine what it was like there on the Damascus Road when your whole world has been turned upside down. Everything you believed you've now discovered is a lie. Everything you thought was a lie, now you believe is the truth. Now you've encountered Jesus Christ. Everything has changed. What do you do next? Where do you turn? Who do you ask? How do you change? Saul didn't know. He needed the Lord to show him. That was hard for a person like Saul. You think about Saul. Who was this guy before he encountered Jesus on the Damascus Road? He was the best of the best. He was top of his class. He was determined to achieve. He was committed to lead and not to follow. And all of a sudden, he's asking somebody else, what do you want me to do? I'm used to being the one who's in charge. I'm used to being the one who's in control. But now I have to ask, what do you want, Lord? See, the Lord knew that the issue of surrender had to be settled, and it had to be settled right away. Until it was done, God could not use Saul. Here's the thing, there is no such thing as a growing believer whose will is not submitted to Christ. There is no such thing as a growing believer who has said to the Lord, look, we'll share control in my life. When it suits me to do what you want, I'll do what you want. But when it suits me to do what I want, I'll do what I want. That'll never work. Only one can be in control. There has to be an experience of surrender when you simply say to the Lord, here I am, whatever you want, whatever you want, I will do it. He is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. So the Lord taught him trust and he taught him surrender. And then finally God taught Saul the lesson of dependence. 
For Saul, this may have been the hardest lesson of all. I am going to depend upon somebody else. I don't think any of us like that. I think all of us like to be able to say, look, I can handle my own life. I can take care of my own affairs. I don't need anybody else. And Saul was just like you and me. And that's why the Lord forced him to learn how to, depend, how to depend upon him and depend upon others. Here's what the Bible says. It says, Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. Paul sp spent three days without sight. This is what the Bible says. It says someone had to take him by the hand and lead him to Damascus. Someone had to help him up the steps and into the place where he would be staying. He was completely dependent upon somebody else to take care of every need in his life. He had no idea how to function. That's hard for anybody, but especially someone who is filled with personal pride. Someone whose life had been identified by arrogance up to that point. He had to learn how to depend upon the Lord. Remember how Acts described him at the beginning of this chapter? It said, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder. What does that say? Pride, arrogance, confidence. He had to learn what it means to be broken. He had to learn what it means to depend upon others, but mostly upon the Lord. I'm convinced that one of the greatest signs of a maturing disciple of Jesus Christ is an attitude of dependence. That the more you grow in Christ, the less you become independent and able to, strong and, uh, able to be strong and able to stand by yourself. And the more you recognize, I have got to depend upon the Lord all of the time in every situation with every decision. I have got to depend upon the Lord be careful of those who come across as being too sure of their own wisdom their own abilities be careful of those people who begin to speak to you and before long you have no doubt that they consider themselves the most spiritual person in the room those people who are truly spiritual, those people you really need to listen to, are the ones who, who with humility recognize, I've still got a long way to go in my life. I'm not nearly where I ought to be. But I can share with you the one who's gotten me as far as I've come. The Lord says, until you're broken, you're useless. Saul had to learn that lesson. Later he wrote to the Corinthians and said, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We have this treasure in jars of clay. He would also say this, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in my weakness. Because those with true spiritual strength are the ones who know what it means to depend hard upon the Lord. And Saul had to let go of his spiritual pride in order to be prepared for what God was going to do through Ananias. So God did some hard work in those three days as Paul sat by himself in a room in the dark wondering what in the world the future was going to hold for him. And then the Lord sent Ananias. Ananias came to equip Saul to grow in Christ. He didn't come with arrogance and boasting. In fact, when you see the contrast between the two, you recognize he came in fear and trembling. Paul was breathing threats and murder. 
Ananias came scared to death. He had heard all about Saul. He recognized what had already happened. Saul's reputation was far ahead of him. I've heard what he's done in Jerusalem. I've heard what he's done in other places, and I know why he was coming here. Lord, why are you sending me to this man? He scares me to death. I don't want him to know my name. I don't want him to know my face. I don't want him to know anything about me. Lord, are you sure you know what you're doing? He came in fear and trembling, but he came in spite of his fear. He came in spite of his hesitation. He obeyed. In spite of his limitations, he followed God's direction. That's a lesson a lot of us need to learn. When it comes to sharing your faith, fear is often present. Fear because of circumstances, fear because of people, fear because God sent you. Sometimes you go even though you're scared to death. Even though there may be rejection ahead or misunderstanding or failure or ridicule or worse. Some people will tell you, you should never feel fear when you share your faith with others. In fact, they'll say to you, if you're experiencing fear, that's a sign that your faith is just not strong enough. If you trusted God more, if you were more confident in the Lord, then you would not be afraid. But they're wrong. It's okay to be afraid when it comes to sharing Christ. In fact, it's often natural to fear that, uh, feel that way. The real issue is, what do you do next? When you're afraid and God says to go, what do you do next? Will you reach out in spite of your fear and offer the eternal life that only Christ can give? Will you reach out in spite of your fear and do what God has sent you to do? Will you reach out in spite of your fear and still share the greatest news that anyone could ever hear? God sent Ananias to restore Saul's sight. But Ananias also gave him so much more. Ananias offered Saul acceptance. The Bible says the first thing that Ananias did was lay his hands on Paul. Now, part of that was that God had already promised Saul that that was exactly what was going to happen. Somebody named Ananias is going to come. He's going to lay your hands, his hands on you. You're going to receive your sight. In a way, it was an act of consecration. Ananias was setting Saul apart for God's use. But I think there was more than that going on. The Bible says that, that Ananias went in and he laid his hands on Saul. And I think that was a personal touch of ministry. Think about this. So here goes Ananias. Remember, he's scared to death. Here comes Ananias, this man sitting in a room by himself. Ananias recognizes he is in the presence of someone who wanted not only to arrest people like him, but kill people like him. And he walks in the room, and here this guy is with this reputation, completely helpless, completely blind. And this instinct rushes over him to reach out and put his hands on a broken, hurting man. Ananias was reaching out to offer the touch of Jesus in Saul's life. And he was also teaching Saul a lesson that he really needed to learn, which is that real ministry can't be done at arm's length. Real ministry can't be done from across the room. Real ministry means you have to get up close and you have to get personal. Don't you reckon there was a lot in Ananias that would say, well, I'm going to go and when I get there, I'm going to stand down on the street below and holler up in that window and say, Saul, God has sent me, now receive your sight and I'm going home. But he recognized it just doesn't work that way. You've got to reach out and touch people if you're ever going to make a difference in their lives. You have to get personal. 
These days you sometimes hear preachers who will tell you, I'm only called to preach. I'm not called to get involved with people. My job is to pre prepare the message, stand up and preach the message, and go back to my office and get ready for the next message. And I'm not supposed to get involved in people's lives. All I know is there's no biblical pattern for that kind of ministry. And in fact, the example of Jesus himself was that he was constantly in the midst of people, constantly noticing individuals, constantly stopping to reach out and share the touch of God with the people around him. God calls us to reveal the love of Jesus in a way that makes it absolutely real in other people's lives. And that's not just done by touch. It's done by words of encouragement. It's done by listening. It's done by praying. It's done by caring. There may be times when God calls you to be the touch of Jesus in somebody else's life. For you, it may not seem that you've done that much. But God, through you, is doing transforming work in people's lives. Sometimes when people are going through times of great tragedy or real loss or grief, folks hesitate to go and they say something along these lines, I I'd like to go and I'd like to show that I care, but, but I don't know what to say. Maybe the situation is so horrific, you just don't know how to give answers. I don't know what to say. And guess what? They probably won't remember anyway. You know what they'll remember? You were there. You were there. And sometimes, just like Ananias, what we need to do is bring the touch of Jesus into the situations and into the lives of other people because when we do, we are extending our hands, extending our hearts, extending our prayers on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. I told someone one time who was hesitating about going into a hospital room where someone was very, very critically ill I said, listen, this is what you need to know. When you walk through that door, you think it's you walking in that room. But they think it's Jesus coming. So you go in Jesus' name. Ananias offered acceptance. He reached out and let Saul know, I am here with you. That's not all. It also says this, and Ananias gave Saul an identity. He called him Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Brother. Mr. Three Days Ago, You Wanted to Kill Me. Brother. With those words, he welcomed Saul into the family of Jesus Christ. He was saying to him, you've got a place where you belong. And God's calling us to do the same thing, to bring people into the family and offer them a place where they know they belong. That's what we do for one another. Brother Saul, Brother Saul. When I was a little boy, I remember going to church and it was kind of interesting because my dad would be talking to his friends as they walked into the church building. And they would call him Bob and he would call them Fred. And then when they walked through the entrance to the church, everything changed. And you know who he became? He became Brother Cooley. And they became Brother Smith. And everybody was brother and sister in my growing up church. That's the only way people referred to one another. I wonder what happened to that. Because that's exactly what uh, Ananias was doing for Saul. He was reaching out and saying, listen, when you come here, when you get involved in, in the church of Jesus, you are my family. You're my brother. We belong to one another. 
Last week I read an article by someone who described himself as an internet pastor. And this is what he wrote. He wrote an editorial and it said, pretty soon church as you know it is going to be dead. Now what he meant by that was people will no longer be gathering in brick and mortar buildings like this one. People will no longer be coming together in Bible studies to gather with one another. People will no longer be found together as believers in groups. Instead, everything's going to be done through social media. We'll just click in from where we are and we'll go to church without ever leaving our house. But social media can't offer what the real church does. It can't offer the identity that comes from being in community with other people. There's a reason that Hebrews 10.25 told us not to forsake assembling ourselves together because when you're together, that's where your identity comes from. Your identity comes from the fact that I am part of not only the family of faith, but a family of faith. A family of faith called the people that make up First Baptist Church. There's no such thing as a thriving believer who does not need a community of faith. Anybody who thinks they can do it better alone is only fooling themselves. I'll never forget several years ago, I was talking to one of my friends who pastored, and he was talking about talking with a man in his neighborhood about coming to church with him. And the man said, Well, I'll be honest with you. He said, Sundays are the day I go out, uh, Sundays are the days I go out on the lake with my boat and fish. And he said, You know something, preacher? He said, You know, I can worship the Lord just as well by myself in my boat as I could if I came to your church. And Dewey looked at him and said, Well, do you? There's something about being in the community of God's people that makes us know I belong to a family, a family that finds its identity in the fatherhood of God and in the lordship of Jesus. And then finally through Ananias, the Lord fulfilled his calling on Saul's life. Ananias said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. What does the Bible say? It says through baptism, God confirmed Saul's new relationship with Christ. It was a reminder to him he was a new creation. That's really what baptism is all about, isn't it? I used to be lost, and now I'm found. I used to be filled with sin, and now I've experienced mercy. I used to be dead, and now I'm alive. I am someone new because of Christ Jesus. Have you ever wondered why we do baptism as a public thing? Why not just do it as a private thing? Why not just say, I'll keep the pool full, and any time you want to be baptized, you just drop by the office and grab me, and we'll come in here, and we'll take care of things. Why not do it that way? And the answer is because this is something you do within this family that you belong to. I have trusted Jesus and he has changed me and I want everybody to know this. And I want this to be part of what it means to say God's brought me into his family. And we do it in front of everybody because that's what God wants us to do. And then through the Holy Spirit, God empowered Saul for the plan that God had in store for him. The Bible says he was baptized and received the Holy Spirit because that was his empowerment to begin his ministry. God had a special plan for Saul and it changed two lives. Saul was on his way to being called to carry the gospel across the known world. He would go places nobody had ever been and speak a gospel that nobody had ever heard. But Ananias was transformed as well. He would never doubt that God could use him in special ways. He would forever say, there was this day I was just going about my business when God reached into my life and said, I want to use you. The same way he reaches into your life. 
in my life, in all of our lives, and says, this is the person, this is the place, this is the time. How can you know that you're doing what God wants you to do? Well, the answer is found in what happened to Ananias. You see, here's the key. God called his name Ananias, and he responded, Here I am, Lord. And in your life, you will hear that same voice calling to you, looking for that same response. If you're here today and you're lost, you don't know Jesus. You don't have a personal relationship with him. Maybe you believe all about him, but you've never trusted him. All you got to do today is say, here I am, Lord. I'm ready to trust you. I want you to be my Savior. Here I am. Or maybe you're here as a believer. And God is speaking to you. It may be about someone he wants to touch through your life. It may be about something he truly wants to do through you. It may be about an act of obedience. It may be part of, uh, about becoming part of this church. It may be part of committing your whole life to him. All I know is this. He will tell you, and all he's waiting for you to say is, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I'm scared. I don't understand all of it. There are things you're still going to have to teach me. But I'm yours. Here I am. Maybe today there's a decision that you need to make. We're going to stand and we're going to sing an invitation hymn. And maybe today is your day to receive Christ as Savior. I'll be here at the front. I would love to lead you to Jesus. Maybe you're here and God wants you to be part of this fellowship. You come, I would love to make you a part of this family of faith. Maybe you're here and God is dealing with you in specific ways about specific things. Maybe God is talking to you about people he wants you to touch. Maybe there's something you need to do. Maybe it's private, but maybe it's public. Is there a way that God is speaking to you? Are you ready to say, here I am? If you are, then you just obey him, and he'll show you the way. Let's stand together. Let's sing.